Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And we're live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. Today, we're going to talk about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And eagle-eared listeners will realise that we've spoken about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band before. But there's always more to say, particularly when we've decided to talk about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the movie, which is quite an extraordinary... Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm slow to call it art, Stephen. I thought you were going to say, which is quite an extraordinary decision for us to have made. <laughs> well, um, you know, can, can we hear ourselves over the sound of people's wirelesses being switched off at this point? Sometimes, you know, we, you know, every now and then we like to uh, throw a curveball, and also we have an idea to discuss something that uh, shouldn't be discussed, but it kind of does need to be discussed. It, it, needs to be, it, it needs to be discussed. It's a public service, and we're going to touch upon some other parts of that arcane world of. Uh, how the Beatles were represented in the 70s through various different shows and, and you know, it, that, that crazy world where people didn't really know what a, uh, 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 how a band should exist if they weren't actually together or how they should be represented. And, you know, as we'll see, the Beatles didn't really have a voice to try and control some of these things. So it's a very wild journey. Yes. Well, well you know, I'm, I'm here for you. <laughs> Thanks. Now, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is what we call in the business a Robert Stigwood joint, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> and it's a 1978 American musical comedy uh, directed by Michael Schultz. We all know him. Written by Henry Edwards. Yep. Uh, hugely famous. Uh, these guys went on to huge careers in the uh, movie biz, music biz. And it is a, uh, a story of a band as they wrangle with the music industry and battle evil forces bent on stealing their instruments and corrupting their hometown of Heartland, USA. It's a subtle piece of work. It's, uh, it's, I have to, like, I will say from the outset, I think um, this movie has zero redeeming qualities whatsoever. And it doesn't even exist on any sort of, you know, so bad it's good no. uh, type, type plane. It's just. It's so bad, it's bad. It's bad. And, you know, we're all, you know, postmodern pop cultural, you know, archivists these days. And we can look back and say, how did this get made? And, you know, what were they thinking? But I think it's kind of obvious as we pull it apart how it actually got made. Yes. Money is what they were thinking. I think. <laughs> Money and um, possibly drugs. The dead can't sue. No, I assume. They, that, that's, that's true. I believe that's correct. Um, so where does it all start? Well, so, you know, as I was kind of saying, there is this odd thing of, you know, the, the Beatles have split in the early 70s. There isn't really a functioning um, Apple core that works or represents the four of them for doing projects that uh, represent the four of them. Um, and one of these projects that kind of starts off in the early 70s is there's a, a play, which we've mentioned in passing before, which is uh, John, Paul, George, Ringo and Bert. So that might be a signpost at the start of this journey, would you say? Yes. So this is this is uh, uh, written by Willie Russell, the Liverpudlian playwright. Um, and essentially, it's a musical in which the Beatles songs are sung by Barbara Dixon, which is... You know, how they were meant to be done. How they were meant I to be done, say. really. <laughs> um, but it was hugely successful. It was hugely successful. Um, it started off in the Everyman Theatre in Liverpool. Um, pretty famous cast, or at least would become famous, you know. So, um, And then it transferred to the West End, and it became a huge success at the time. Now the cast in the cast you had um, Bernard Hill played John Lennon, who went on to appear in uh, I remember Boys from the Black Stuff was not Bernard Hill. Yeah. Um, Trevor Eve played Paul McCartney. Shoestring, shoestring. Uh, extreme measures with Trevor Eve. If you've ever seen uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the trip, um, and uh, some other people played George and Ringo. You know, which is oh, Anthony Share. Anthony Share. Who's Anthony Share? Oh no, we're going to have to cut this out. Anthony Share, the great Shakespearean actor. Well, whose I'm just... performance of Richard the Third on crutches is just transformed modern Shakespearean theatre. Stephen, you're talking to me, a guy with more monkeys albums than, you know, 
Uh, I don't really know who Anthony, um, I do apologize if Anthony Sher is listening. He's not related to Cher, Cher. No, he's no not. I don't think it's the right. Cher. Uh, and <laughs> Philip Joseph, who I don't know, possibly, you know. <laughs> he could be bigger than anyone. Um, <laughs> but this was a 1974 thing, so it did pop up in our 1974 episode because one Beatle went to see the show. One Beatle went to see it. You know, who, who, is, the, who is the most outgoing, cheery, upbeat, theatre-loving Beatle that there ever could be? If I check this piece of paper, it's Mr. George Harrison, Harry Georgeson himself. And he did not like this show one bit. No. Uh, and he, he, he walked out. He should have known. He should have known that uh, this is the kind of thing that would wind him up. Well, Derek Taylor took him to see this show. Derek Taylor should have known. Yeah. Um, and I think the, one of the immediate consequences was he withdrew consent for them to use Here Comes the Sun. And they just replaced it with Good Day Sunshine, which yeah, you could argue which song is the better song. Here comes, Here comes the, sun. the sun is the better song. Yes, that's not really a discussion to have. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, it does represent this kind of crazy world uh, where, uh, you know, the Beatles likenesses and Beatles songs uh, uh, are able to, you know, have a West End play constructed around them. And, you know, there's something to keep in mind when we talk about these types of projects is, you know, you kind of think of, you know, the 21st century crossover, you know, pollination, how, you know, we see now how all these acts are selling off their rights and their likenesses. Yeah. And, and, you know, these things are have a huge value to them. And at the time, you know, they obviously were using the songs legally, but it was still a question of, oh, can we use the songs? Yeah, I suppose you can. It wasn't a big deal. It It's other people sort of appropriating the likeness, the songs, the images in the vacuum that was left by the Beatles sort of fighting amongst themselves. And, you know, they were all more focused on their solo careers. They had, as you say, there's no, there's no roadmap at this stage for what you do with a band or how the members of a band behave after the band yeah. has, has split up. You know, usually a band splits up and, you know, they all go off and do cabaret, you know, but here they're, they're forging their own solo careers. And they're, they're really not interested, I think, except there is that always that sort of niggle in the background with all four of them that they are being exploited and that other people are making money from them, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so Robert Stigwood has a notion of wanting to turn this play into a movie. Yes, um, should we talk a little bit about Robert Stigwood first? Because it's possible, you know, I'm sure a lot of people know him, but he's, if he's known for anything, I think these days, he's known as being the guy who guided the Bee Gees through their 70s success. But what's really, you know, interesting is that his thread goes all the way back to working uh, in the music business in the 60s and also, very importantly, getting involved in NEM. So what's his background? He, uh, well, he's Australian, but, you know, uh, we not hold that against him. Um, we, he, we do, you know, you know, this podcast goes out in Australia. Uh, does Stephen. it? Does it, it does. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Love Australia. He's Australian, which is great. Right. Um, and uh, he, he says himself that he, he kind of bucked the trend by, uh, you know, following the hippie trail in reverse. And he kind of moves from uh, journeys from Australia via Asia and back into the UK. And he's sort of determined, I think, from an early age to get into the entertainment business, into uh, show business. And in 1960, uh, sort of 59, 60, he opens a theatrical agency. And his first thing was to sign up an actor called John Layton. Mm. Well, I only know him because of what he went on to do with Joe Meek. Yes. So he was, yeah, so that, that's, that was, that's, was his big hit, Johnny Remember Me, which was this very weird and unusual Joe Meek production. So I don't, you know, he, he, he sends him along to singing auditions. He, he gets a break. He uh, signs up with Joe Meek and suddenly Joe Meek and uh, uh, Stigwood are in the record business. They're producers and uh, it, it sort of goes from there and uh, he becomes a promoter he is in that field and then in 1965 he promotes a chuck berry uh tour in the uk which fails to draw audiences and he has to declare bankruptcy now that's a weird thing that chuck berry tour because um you know chuck berry is uh 
he, he was mercurial. Is that a very, That's is that a nice, fair comment. That's a very political thing to say. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, if I told you my story about seeing Chuck Berry, I... I um, was it outside, I, a, outside a gig? You, were, you yeah, had no tickets to, and you were hoping for that the Chuck would generously offer you a free pass? Well, it was in London about 10 years ago, about 2008, and uh, he was playing in Camden and I was waiting around outside to see could I get a ticket from a scalper and I couldn't, but a car pulled up and out came Chuck Berry who was standing about three or four feet away from me and literally about one minute before the gig was due to start and he's not the type of guy where you'd go hey how's it going you know Chuck trying to sign this I just thought I'll just look at Chuck Berry and and put it into my memory bank and he sort of breezed past me and literally I would say within about 60 to 120 seconds he was on stage doing his thing and uh, I was like well that's that's better than seeing any Chuck Berry show but but he was still dialing it in that way in London in 1965. I think so. I saw him in the 80s and he was, you know, he's probably still wearing the same white nylon pants that he was uh, <laughs> he, he was wearing in 65. So this 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 uh, tour does not sell well. And I suppose in 1965, you know, he was maybe a bit passe or for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, and can I tell my Chuck Berry in London? This is a funny story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is an album recorded uh, in, in 1965. And I, I don't think the album is completely recorded in London, but it eventually comes out as Chuck Berry in London. And um, it was arranged that he would record the entire thing on the day of his London show. And the only instruction to the producer were to get him a group of musicians that knew his stuff and be finished in time for Chuck to go and <laughs> sign, sign check the live show at 5 p.m. I'm not sure that Chuck Berry ever sign checked anything. So they booked the, the, the studio for 10 a.m., which was to allow time for two standard three-hour sessions and a bit of a, a break. 10 a.m. arrives, the musicians are there. By 11, no sign of Chuck. 1 p.m., still no Chuck. And effectively, the first session is over. Uh, the union rep calls time on a lunch break. 2.15, Chuck saunters through the door of the studio, does not explain, apologize, plugs uh, in his guitar and asks each member of the band in turn just to play a few bars of something. You know, eight bars of no particular place to go, test the bass player, Maybelline, assess the drummer, etc. Audition over and happy. He unplugs the guitar and says, have you got an office in this place? I need an office. And the producer, who is really hysterical at this point, goes, Chuck, what do you need an office for? It's nearly three o'clock. We have two hours to cut this album. And Chuck says, well, I've got to write the fucking songs. (laughs) He's like, yeah, great. That's Chuck. That's Chuck. Um, Yeah. Uh, And somehow these uh, these sparsely attended Chuck gigs uh, put Stigwood bankrupt. But Stigwood didn't go away with his tail between his legs. He just decided to keep on plowing on as if uh, he hadn't had any bankruptcy at all and his That's return it. to profitability is is uh, quite it's swift. quite it's quite dramatic so i mean the first thing is he turns up at his bankruptcy hearing in a chauffeur driven limousine yeah. that he has rented for the day just to you know he's he's the man he's got to maintain this but his in it, 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 by 1966 he's the booking agent for the who yeah He's, he's moving them away from Brunswick with those sort of early releases. And suddenly he's on, they're on the reaction label, which is his label distributed by Polydor. Uh, within a few months, he's managing Cream, signs, signs them to reaction. Um, and then in 1967, he signs uh, the Bee Gees. And he's also the guy famously who Don Arden, the other 60s uh, manager, dangled out the window by his ankles, um, uh, we think, because he took an interest in the small faces who were Don Arden's band. Don Arden, of course, the father-in-law of um, famed ELO manager Sharon Osbourne. Um, But what I find fascinating about Stigwood is he becomes... uh, he basically becomes very quickly like a right-hand man to Brian Epstein in NEMS in 1967. Yes. And it's, uh, you know, before Brian dies, he's making a plan to kind of bequeath it for no particular reason to Robert. This is, yeah, this is a very odd episode. Um, I, 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 you know, I've read that there aren't a lot of, books, biographies on, on Brian Epstein, but this is a, an odd chapter. So the, the general consensus seems to be that Brian is just 
retired. Mm. You know, by 67, his role as the Beatles manager is, is sort of receding with the, with the, uh, them stopping touring. You know, there's a couple of stories where he's really, it's made clear to him he's not particularly welcome uh, in the studio and certainly not required to comment on what they're doing in the studio. He has other artists, you know, he's built up this roster, none of whom really, I mean, no, none of them obviously are, are, are comparable to the Beatles. He has a very good relationship with Cilla Black, who's scoring hit singles, but in a sort of cabaret mode. And he just, I think, has got to the point where he wants to take a step back from, if you think, we all sort of appreciate how hectic this life was for the Beatles yeah, between absolutely. 63 and 67, 66 in particular. But Epstein is there every step of the way. Um, and he's just looking to step back. And, and one uh, sort of indication of that is he passes the demo tape. He's got a demo tape of uh, the BG, Bee Gees and he passes this to Stigwood. Stigwood, yeah. And kind of says, you know, this, this is a band you might be interested in. You think Epstein was savvy enough that if he got that tape, he, he, he would have heard the potential there. You know, the, the Bee Gees at that stage had a very beatle sound. Well, the, the yeah, and, you know, the original, the big sort of, uh, I know the Bee Gees have been, a, you know, child stars in Australia and all the rest. Yeah. Uh, hello again to Australia. That, um, you know, the New York mining disaster, the first international single released from the Bee Gees was initially put out as a white label to make people think it was the Beatles. And, yeah. you know, uh, Stigwood paid for this to be played on Radio Caroline, I think, or he paid for maybe Sticks and Specs it was to, Sticks and Specs to get played on Radio Caroline using... Uh, Nem's money. Uh, and so Brian sort of out of the blue says, well, I'm going to merge Nem's with the Robert Stigwood agency and bring Robert in under my wing. And uh, the Beatles were not happy about this person suddenly appearing on the horizon. No, I think Brian's idea was that Stigwood would take over the day-to-day -day running. He'd be responsible for all the other artists. Brian would retain um the Beatles, but I think the Beatles could see the way this was going. And, uh, you know, Paul McCartney uh, in uh, 2000 re recounts this and said, well, you know, if you do this, if you manage to pull this off, we're, we're just going to record God Save the Queen for every single record from now on. Yeah. We sing out of tune. That's a promise. So this guy buys us. That's what he's buying. Um, uh, and that kind of put paid to that. So it was very clear. They just absolutely refused to work. <laughs> And the parallels are very curious that, you know, the, the the four of them are very much against Stigwood. Two years later, when it's Klein, it's a different kind of universe or a different um, vibe. And, and the, you know, Stigwood undoubtedly went on to huge amounts of success. And, you know, you can't help but feel there's a bit of a, a baton passing from the success mm. of Brian to the success of Stigwood. But my feeling about Robert Stigwood has always been, and I, I hope this doesn't upset anybody out there, but he didn't really have... Uh, the 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 art that Epstein had, or the class, or uh, you know, he didn't have any of the finesse or style that Epstein had. He was a kind of a, a boisterous deal maker who, you know, enjoyed his the success of his charges. But you know, he wouldn't have understood, you know, Peter Blake doing an album cover, that kind of thing, the way Brian would have understood that kind of thing. He was a very he painted in broad strokes. He he was a businessman. He, he yeah. was effectively coming at it, I think, from a business angle where Brian came into it from that kind of theatrical background and was more interested perhaps in the aesthetics, you know. Yeah. It, was all, it yeah. was all about the trousers, I suppose. All about the trousers. But there is a, there is, you know, if poor Brian had lived, there is this version of events where, you know, imagine if we had an apple that where Brian is kind of this cultural leader and liaison to the Beatles. Robert Stigwood is the businessman and Apple has the Beatles, the Bee Gees, Cream, yeah. all those people under one roof. That would have been a powerhouse. You know, if you think, you know, if, 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 if Apple had put out Saturday Night Fever, but instead Robert Stigwood sets up his own organization, RSO, which is, becomes this big successful label and enterprise for the next number of years. Yes. And the seed money for that comes from NEMS. Yeah, because the, the transaction was actually that he transferred the assets of, of, of the Stigwood organization into NEMS. And then the Beatles kind of put the brakes on that. And after Brian died in August, uh, Stigwood left NEMS and effectively kind of got a golden handshake, uh, which was the seed money for uh, RSO. 
I mean, I, I certainly remember in the 70s, you know, the, the, the RSO label on records was kind of beige with RSO in red. And yeah, I mean, it's it, a red it, hippo, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it kind of appeared everywhere. Uh, yeah. you, you know, it was all over the place. Thigwood was everywhere. Yeah, he was everywhere. And, you know, we can be sneery about the Sgt. Pepper movie because let's not forget that's what we're here to talk about. But he went off on a run of success for 10 years with the Bee Gees and the Bee Gees dipped a little bit, but then he never lost faith in the Bee Gees. They came back. He stayed managing Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton stayed on the RSO label. He had the Jesus Christ Superstar soundtrack and show, made a ton of money off that. Um, he had a he had a golden touch and, you know, this leads to Saturday Night Fever in Greece as well. Also RSO things. Well, this is it because it wasn't just records it was west end shows so you say oh calcutta uh was was there um hair. Was hair you know all of these things um so uh yeah he was involved with tommy um the the film um which was sort of a huge commercial success so yeah he, and he another was... very strong precedent for you know a sergeant pepper film you know because tommy uh was a bit critically all over the place but you know ken russell gave it a certain visual eye and it's still you know worth looking at today it's a bit it's a bit uneven but you know it's yeah. still got some some really key bits but if we go back to this notion of the john paul george ringo and bert play robert stigwood sticks his nose in and says this should be a movie and it, this thing goes into pre-production. So what happens there? It does. There's, there is a sort of a, 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 a pre-production setup. And uh, Peter Bryan is involved uh, mm -hmm. in that. So he's brought on board. Um, but it just it just doesn't get off the ground. Um, but as you say, there is pre-production. There, there, there are scripts. There are, uh, uh, you know, uh, sign stages being constructed. And then Stigwood pulls the plug and i think that the, 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 there are issues around you know by this stage george has withdrawn permission for the for his songs to be used in the the, the play he's not going to have those for the film and for whatever reason it just doesn't uh it, it just doesn't proceed yeah now you found a blog posting from a chap called miles tredinick yes who ended up being kind of a uh, employed by the Robert Stigwood organization as a bit of a gopher and a, to be a right-hand man for Peter Brown in the early days of trying to get this film off the ground. Yes, he, he was he was Peter Brown's kind of uh, sidekick, his assistant and uh, driver, except for the fact that he didn't have a driving license. Um, but um, <laughs> so, yeah, he, he, he recounts, you know, there were costume fittings and he, he talks about... Um, uh, Trevor Eve as Paul McCartney, Bernard Hill as, as, as Lennon wandering around in their Sergeant Pepper outfits. And he goes, oh, it was just like being involved with the Beatles movies, uh, Help or A Hard Day's Night, except there were no Beatles. <laughs> That's kind of important. It's kind um, of important, yeah. But this movie kind of uh, splutters to a halt after a few weeks of pre-production. And this guy, Miles, says, you know, it is a personal disappointment. You know, he kind of wasn't used to the fact that these things can sometimes turn on a on a dime. Um, he, he does give a very uh, nice story, though, about um, wandering around uh, the studios at Elstree one day and following a noise. Yes. So he's 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 with this uh, acquaintance and they he says, oh, there's a Terry, Terry Thomas is is filming. And this guy says, OK, you know, could go to the side that where Terry Thomas is filming, have a look at that. And they wander in and they suddenly realize that they've uh, wandered into uh, Paul McCartney and Wings sign checking or rehearsing for their Wings Over America tour. Um, yeah. And the way he describes it, he said, um, uh, you know, as we walked through the scenery, we saw some bright lights at the far end. We moved towards them. The music was loud, uh, uh, loud and we imagined. And I thought, you're mistaking Wings sign check for a Terry Thomas movie because he suddenly it goes. It be easily done. As our eyes adjusted to the brightly coloured lights, we suddenly realised it wasn't Terry Thomas at all. It was Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah, well, OK. Uh, yeah. So they, they get to hang around and watch an entire, uh, uh, an entire sound check. And uh, it turns out Jimmy McCulloch, who's in the band, is actually uh, a, friend of, uh, a friend of the friend. And they get to hang around and see Paul rehearsing his acoustic set. Yeah, and this footage actually turns up on uh, footage from these rehearsals is on the Venus and Mars uh, deluxe edition. Um, so uh, it must be true. Um, so so this is now 19, 1975. And in 74, 75, Stigwood is also involved on a show that has a short run on Broadway, which is perhaps more of a precursor to the movie. 
so this is the Sergeant Pepper live. Yeah. Uh, so it's a live touring show. So it's, it's called what? Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band on the road. On the road. That's its official name. Yeah. And uh, it actually pops up. Uh, some eagle-eyed people might have spotted in the Mind Games video. If you watch the Mind Games video, John is wandering the streets of New York and then towards the end of the video, he stops at a poster for this show and points at it and kind of appears. He does that thing where he jumps onto the stage, but you can't really tell if it's the stage for that or not. But he is outside at this show where it's being performed. That's where I first found out about it. I mean, the first the first concert I ever went to um, as a kind of, I don't know, 15 year old or 14 year old was a Beatles tribute band. Oh, um, that explains a lot. It does in kind of 78, maybe 77, 78. Um, and it, it was, so it was quite the thing, you know, there were, there were, there were, there were tribute shows going on at that time. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, there was publicity and there were news stories uh, that this was, this was kind of happening. This was a bit of a, a revival. I can't link it to anything in particular, but it, you know, it was, this just seems to have been the precursor for that. Um, so you, you, you get some, you know, musicians together, they impersonate the Beatles, they replicate the songs. And, you know, I, I, I took my niece, nieces and nephew uh, to see a similar show about, five years ago in the Grand Opera House in Belfast. So still going. It is, yeah. And even, uh, you know, even the bootleg Beatles have been going for, I think, about yeah. 40 years now. So I have never managed to see the bootleg Beatles. Every time they come to Belfast or where I am, I'm somewhere else. I remember I saw them in Dublin back in the 90s and they were great. I can't can't fault the bootleg Beatles at all. Um, so, so yeah, so we're, we're, we're hovering around 1974-75. Um, Stigwood has this off-Broadway Beatles show, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band on the Road, and thinks, well, you know, I've been involved in the Tommy movie. But why don't I take this kind of show and make it into another, you know, we haven't really coined the phrase jukebox musical yet, but that's what he's trying to create. And, uh, you know, he's having a, a reasonable run. And um, we're not exactly at the point where Saturday Night Fever has taken over the world yet, or Greece has taken over the world. So the seeds of the Bee Gees getting involved predates their massive success. Yes, they're, they're, the, the, Bee Gees, the Bee Gees have had their success in the late 60s and then are in a bit of a, a, bit of a trough. Yes. So uh, although in 75, it starts to, it starts to come back because Jive Talking becomes a big hit. The, the key thing is they are contracted to Stigwood. He is their manager. He is he is to them what Epstein was to the Beatles. You know, he, yes. the, the Bee Gees are his first group. You know, they're they're the big uh, success, and uh, so they are kind of yeah, they're they're kind of in enthralled to him, if not in hock to yes. him. Yes. And, and he's tethered to them. You're right to use the Epstein analogy. Stigwood is tethered to the Bee Gees uh, more so than he is to Eric Clapton or any yep. of the other people who's, who he's involved with. And, um, you know, they, they, the Bee Gees listen to him and, you know, know that he is going to... No, he wouldn't steer them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe a bit naively, but... Um, you know, there's the, the Bee Gees at this point, you know, if we get to 1975, they are still very young and they seem very old. And there's footage, you can pull footage of them on, uh, there's this footage of them on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show in 1974, where they're kind of in that space. They're promoting, I think, their Life in a Tin Can album, which, mm -hmm. um, have you ever seen the cover of that album? No. It's a picture of the three Bee Gees looking out from inside a tin can. It's the most literal album cover you'll see ever. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, they, they've never gone away, but they are trying to find their place still yeah. and they're still all in their 20s at this point you know they haven't i always think of the Bee Gees as being 10 or 15 years older than they actually are and they're not and even at the time you know when they're doing night fever and they're wearing the white suits um uh, robin and morris are still in their 20s they are still young guys and stigwood has been there through the ups and downs and and is still trying to get them I have to say, I, didn't look, I, I did not look like that in my 20s, I have to say. <laughs> uh, neither did I. I. I didn't wear that much uh, satin. Um, but Stigwood decides to spin out this Sergeant, the Sergeant Pepper's Only Hearts Club band on the road again, 
you know, the Beatles not really managing any of their copyright or the likenesses of it and licensing songs or whatnot. Uh, and he hires uh, a guy called Henry Edwards to write a script who's obviously written hundreds of scripts. No, no, sorry. He's never written any scripts before. <sighs> it's either sort of complete naive faith in this guy or it's just hubris gone mad it's this idea that you know i can do anything if whatever i want i'm at that point where i've had success with all of these artists these musicals i can do this i can make a film um so yeah so he gives this guy who's no experience at all (laughs) he 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 gives them the songs and says uh I'd like you to write a script. So he was a journalist. Henry Henry Edwards is a journalist. He'd written something that Stig in the New York Times that Sigwood liked. And and what Edwards says is, I spread the songs out on my apartment floor and went to work. Mr. Stigwood wanted a concept. I told him I'd like to to do a big MGM like musical. We'd synthesize forms and end up with an MGM musical, but with the music of today. And you think yeah. you 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 you've got to admire his self belief. But then, but then. That was the basis of Yellow Submarine. You know, you just string some songs together. It's but- fundamentally the same story as Yellow Submarine, which is string some random Beatles songs together so that some kind of magic band yeah. can save a town. That's yes. it. Except that was a cartoon. Here, that's right. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> now it's, that you mention it, now that I mention it, it this was is a cartoon. This is going to be a live action movie, and you need great actors. And I'm thinking Anne Margaret in Tommy. Yes, I'm sure you think about Anne Margaret. I think about Anne Margaret in Tommy quite <laughs> a, a lot. <laughs> quite yes. a lot. Uh, um. Anyway, the script is assembled, <laughs> and uh, the cast needs to be brought together. Yeah. Um, so in, the Bee Gees are kind of coming back up because their main course album comes out in 1975, but they still haven't hit into the Saturday Night Fever thing yet. And in 1976, the Bee Gees record. Um, three Beatle cover songs for another odd 70s thing, All This and World War II, a documentary of news footage of World War II set to Beatles cover versions. Again, uh, another logical project. Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure they all signed off on that in Apple. And uh, the Bee Gees contribute Golden Slumber's Carry That Weight. She came through the bathroom window and Sun King to that. That's an interesting album as a side point. Peter Gabriel, Jeff Lynne. Brian Ferry. Stuff on it. Brian Ferry. Um, so, but, you know, Stigwood is going to sign the Bee Gees up to um, do this movie instead of, you know, people who could act. The, the Bee Gees had already done a, a TV special called Cucumber Castle, which uh, has ended up being two of them. And I've seen clips of it on YouTube. And if that was any kind of screen test, that should have. Which, which one refused to do it? Uh, well, there was a time when... Was Robin um, being a bit antsy? That, that, yeah, there was a time when the Bee Gees were just Barry and Morris. And uh, I can't, I can't, uh, I, I get, I'm not a, the Bee Gees chronology is a bit all over the place, but I, I don't, I think all three of them are actually in the TV special, but only the two of them are on the album. I think that's how it works. Well, of course, Mar- Morris is is moving in the Beatles circles. He he claims to be play, playing piano on All Things Must Pass, if you remember. Ah, I, I'd forgotten that, but I do know that uh, Morris was the one. And you know, if you're if you're if you don't know your BGs, Morris is the little bald fellow. <laughs> 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 Morris, who's who's usually on a guitar or some yeah. rubbish, and uh, Morris was married to Lulu, and Lulu and Morris lived in Highgate. And they lived near when Ringo had a house, a very nice modernist house in Highgate, because I went looking at it one day when I used to live near Highgate. And uh, they were neighbours and they would go to parties. So he was he, he was, was, um, he was in the circle. I bet I bet Morris's house was full of Ringo or Robin furniture. I'm sure it was. And brandy. And brandy as well. And brandy. Um, so uh, so the, all these kind of constituent parts are coming together. You have a successful impresario. You have a band who are coming on the upcrest of a wave. You have uh, all this Beatles movie and you have uh, the hype, which, you know, as, as the deal comes together to get this movie made, to say that, you know, the most obvious comparison is that it will be this generation's gone with the wind. Yes. Which is what they called it. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, set yourself a low bar, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't remember. The, I don't remember "Gone with the Wind" being a musical. It's a long time since I watched it, but I don't recall the dan- song and dance number while Atlanta burns. Uh, I, you, you know? <laughs> no, I, nor me. 
Uh, not that I, I don't think I've ever seen Gone with the Wind, to be honest. Yes. Um, I'm wondering at which point do we drop the fantastic quote from Robin Gibb? Why don't we just tell people the quote after the break? End of part one. Intermission. End of intermission. Part two. Welcome back. Um, so we left you on a very strong cliffhanger. Robin Gibb, before the movie, gave a very uh, pertinent quote and uh, assuming the role of Robin Gibb is Stephen Cockcroft. So, Robin, uh, what would you like to say to your fans at home about the Beatles? Well, there's no such thing as the Beatles now. They don't exist as a band. They never perform Sgt. Pepper live in any case. When ours comes out, it will be, in effect, as if theirs never existed. And he was proved wrong. So wrongity wrong. Uh, it's it's not uh, true. Was he was he on glue or, <laughs> or, yeah, or o- overcome by the wig glue? Wig wig fumes. Fu- fumes of wig glue. Yes. Fumes of wig glue. Uh, fumes of wig glue. I think that's a. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a caravan album. Anyway, the uh, uh, the the movie um, it doesn't come out till the summer of uh, seventy eight. And and let's talk about the movie itself because the Bee Gees are not the only stars of the movie. The other hot ticket in seventy six seventy seven is the one and only Mister Peter Frampton, another another um, exile from uh, All Things Must Pass. Well, what you'll notice when you look at the final cast, if you watch the end credits of this movie, is how many people from either All Things Must Pass or Ringo's All-Star Band <laughs> and <laughs> turn up in this enterprise. It's quite, it's quite uh, strange. Um, and so, so, so Frampton is also on the crest of a wave, but a bit of an unusual wave in that he's got the world's biggest selling live album, Frampton Comes Alive. Yes. And in some ways, what we now know with retrospect is Frampton Comes Alive was not the beginning of something wonderful. It was kind of the end of something wonderful. Once you get to the top, the only way is down. Well, except our, our friends, the Beatles proved otherwise, but that was the whole thing that, you know, <laughs> makes them difficult to follow. Um, um, yes, P- P- Peter Frampton was absolutely huge at this point, and um, you know I don't I don't kind of profess to be a huge Peter Frampton fan. I mean, I I, I he has a he has a very good album has just come out this year, which is uh, um, instrumental, instrumental yeah, and it has a very good version of uh, Isn't It a Pity. Peter Frampton at this stage is a very odd point at a very odd point in his career because he's kind of started off in, in 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 sort of groups like the herd and humble pie and he was the kind of good looking guitar player and and then he he does this thing where he appears on the front cover of rolling stone with his shirt off and it's like hello teeny bop fans goodbye credibility and it it, it kind of he's you know he he he's, doesn't seem to be quite sure where his audience is at this point yep. and i don't think he's getting particularly good management advice at this stage he's he's got a biography out which is very good very readable very interesting so yes he is persuaded that this is his next career move is to sign up to play the part of billy shears uh in this movie and and the Bee Gees play the hendersons for some reason yeah well the hendersons will all be there yeah yeah um and and so yeah peter frampton has frampton comes alive in 76 he releases his follow-up studio album i'm in you <laughs> in 1977 you which, couldn't get away with that in 2021 well it's uh well you should see what the knack called their albums but the uh i'm in you which has this awful cover and which is kind of like the the no parlays it's just one of those albums that is constantly in uh, secondhand bins uh, and there's a bit of a supporting cast with you know paul nichols in particular is is and donald pleasance are also in this movie but let's talk about the film itself because once again we have watched it so you don't have to and i first saw this film in the 90s i found it in a video store and uh it's been early 90s and it wasn't an easy find and i kind of knew it wasn't very good but i thought well i better go watch it because i like the beatles and i watched it and i did not watch it again until this past week because, uh, as I might have mentioned at the top, it has no redeeming qualities. It is no kind of so bad it's good. It's just, uh, it's a mess. It's a big, hot mess. Well, this is the point at which I have to confess, where I first saw this film. 
in the cinema. In the cinema. You're in, joking. In the tonic, <laughs> in the tonic cinema, which is this beautiful 1930s Art oh, Deco cinema in Bangor, and I went to see it in in the cinema in '78. Yeah. My gosh. And uh, I know I obviously sneaked out past my babysitter. And uh, <laughs> um, was there a supporting feature? Like, you know, I, I don't recall. <laughs> I don't recall um, the, the I mean, I think at this stage, the only films I'd actually been to see in the cinema were Tommy. OK. Uh, with Anne Margaret and other people. There were some other people in it, but Anne Margaret was in it. Uh, Kentucky <laughs> Fried Movie, which is terrible. And uh, uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Pepper, possibly Jaws. When did Jaws come out? Jaws was 75. This is why I never swim in the sea, because I saw Jaws when I was 13. But I didn't know this. Like, so you obviously went to see this as a Beatles fan. Yes. Uh, expecting a big treat. And I thought you, this was I thought this was going to be great. Did you hate it or did you pretend to like it? Like you know, when I you're am. a kid, you don't have much experience of things and you I, pretend to like it. Absolutely hated it. Oh, good. I remember absolutely hating it. The other thing I, I the other thing I remember is that EMI jumped on the bandwagon and EMI released uh Sgt. Pepper uh with a little help from my friends as a single with A Day in the Life. Right. And they actually put that out as a standalone single. It was the first time uh, there'd been an official, in inverted commas, single pulled off the Sgt. Pepper album. Huh. Um, it did not, it did not, because uh, I remember having that discussion thinking, oh, this is great. The Beatles are going to, you know, it's going to storm up the charts. It's going to be, um, but it didn't. It didn't. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about two things because there is the movie and there is the album. I know they, they, they yeah. significantly overlap, but the, the movie, uh, for those who haven't seen it, it is a pure musical. It's basically all the songs threaded together. Everything is sung. Um, it's it, Tommy is the template. It has no the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, you know, and it, you know, it's 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 an easy to follow plot. Well, the plot begins as you would expect it to do in war torn France in 1918, where Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band are deployed as the Allies' most effective weapon, <sighs> where their melodies uh, stop hostilities and they win the Golden Eagle Award and return to their hometown of Heartland, which is something you notice about this movie, which is it's very American. There's certainly nothing Liverpudlian about it or English about it or anything like that. It's hard no. to actually get any sense. Like you're being hammered for almost two hours by Beatles songs. You get no zero sense of the Beatles or any no. of the things that make the Beatles in this film at all. But when this film and album comes out, the Beatles will cease to exist. Of course. Sorry, you're right. You're absolutely right. So thank you, Robin. Point. This is the point. <laughs> so, so, so the band then they 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 lived through the Roaring Twenties, the Depression, through another war, and then Sergeant Pepper dies in 1958, which is you know sad enough. No, it's pretty sad. But then you know what's 20 years after 1958, Stephen? Uh, 1978. So it was oh. 20 years. Ago, you see. I see. That, that's the concept. Did you know? Is that just I see. You know? That's that's. I see what they've done there. I see <laughs> yeah. what they've done there. What they what the, what they've literally done yes. is literally take the literal meaning of the song and <laughs> literally turn it into a film. It's literally said it was twenty years ago today, and use that one line to spin off into a totally different direction. Yeah. Um, yeah, because the Sergeant Pepper, obviously, his musical instruments were magical, and he left them to the town of Heartland. And um, so that, you know, people could be happy forever. So these instruments are going to play an important plot point uh, in a few minutes. As, as a lawyer, could I could I point out at this <laughs> point, just, just for the benefit, it is technically not possible to bequeath chattels to a town. I just like to point that out um, in case oh, okay. anyone is and anyone but, is taking this. But they can uh, be magical. Gotcha. They can, they can be magical. They have the power to make dreams come true. And yep. as long as they remain in the town's possession, humanity will live happily forever after. But you can't actually do that. Okay, well, fine then. Um, we're introduced to Peter Frampton as Billy Shears, who's like this, uh, introduced as an American small town boy, because we have a, in case the movie's too hard to understand, we have a narrator in the form of children's favourite George Burns, who at this point in the universe is 81 years age. Uh, 81 years of age, and um, he plays the mayor, uh, Mr. Kite. See what they did there? Yeah. And uh, the, the the then Mark, Dave, and Bob Henderson uh, are Billy Shears' best friends, and they are the Bee Gees, and the four of them together are the new Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. 
Could I just say there are no more rock and roll names than Mark, Dave, and Bob Anders? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, well, there's obviously famous Bobs, but yes. Um, and they have a, they have a, a, a stepbrother, Dougie Shears, who's played by uh, Paul Nicholas. Uh, and he's kind of a bit of a bad egg. Ooh, we don't like him. We don't like him. He's like a poor man's David Essex. I love David Essex. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> um, he uh, so everything is going reasonably well, um, but uh, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't be uh, watching George Burns do his own version of fixing a hole, which was yes, because it, it's yes. So this is a sort of semi dream sequence in which Mr. Kite briefly imagines himself as a superstar, and he does a jaunty dance with two little girls in in what is, I think, the first of several deeply unsettling uh, scenes in the movie. I think what the first unsettling thing to happen in the movie is, because we're kind of going through the credits at this point, is that it shows you that the music was produced by George Martin. And you're like, no, George, no. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Don't produce this movie. But George Martin did the music. That's He did. His wife persuaded him. Yeah, uh, and uh, his hope- wife said, "His wife said, but George, if you don't do this, someone else will do it and make a terrible, terrible job of it, and won't treat it sympathetically. And look at the size of that paycheck. <laughs> look at this pile of cash in the corner <laughs> over there. Oh my God! So, um, so then the bad guy is introduced, Mean Mister Mustard, uh, played by, of course, Frankie Howard." Huge American movie star, Frankie Huge Howard. Huge American movie star. There what was, was a, going on there? There was a TV special around this time in America, uh, hosted by David Frost, introducing Frankie Howard to American audiences, which obviously worked a treat. Um, but yeah, he, I, I don't know. What, yeah, Frankie Howard how would, is... How would you describe Frankie Howard? He, he, he's like a post-war British... He's a post-war British entertainer who would have had radio shows, theatre shows... He was a very funny guy, and he had up Pompeii. It was obviously his big 70s sitcom, but he was a kind of a very broad uh, comedic actor and, uh, you know, kind of a loved British icon. But you would not think of him as a movie star or someone who could... I know there was an up Pompeii film, but you wouldn't really expect him to have any kind no. of actorly no. insights to carry a film. No. Yeah, well, he is mean Mr. Mustard. And hold on tight, folks, because later on he's going to get massaged by robots. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the you know the the, the, the the Hendersons and Billy Shears just want to have some fun. They they like to record in a barn. Um, but Donald Pleasance is a big evil record uh, executive man. And well, well um, Donald, Donald Pleasant is evil. He is, yeah, he is evil. Um, but uh, he eventually they get summoned, squired to L.A. And uh, they just fall for all the bad things. They do. Billy has to leave his girlfriend behind. His girlfriend being Strawberry Fields. Her name is Strawberry Fields. Yeah. Um, and they, they they share a tender night of romance in the farm's hayloft. Um, <laughs> they do. There's one or two moments in the film where if you're thinking this is supposed to be a film for kids, it's just a little bit odd. A um, little the, the, bit odd. The romp in the hay is one of them. Um, the sort of the the, the George the Burns the George Burns dancing with twelve year old girls is odd. Yes, again he is dead. So, um, but uh, uh, and then the the sort of the record label signing sequence, which sort of has this allusion to drugs, and then sleeping with women and going off and not you know, not just not just any women, the sexy assistant Lucy and her backing band, the Diamonds. Diamonds yeah, see what, again. This full this film is full of see what they did there. When I was watching the, the the scene where they're signing the record contracts and they're all drunk and Donald Pleasance is plying them with alcohol and all the rest, it was at that moment it really, really came home to me that the Bee Gees cannot act. They cannot, they're not funny, they're not engaging. And I am not knocking the Bee Gees music because their own oeuvre is sensational. They have written some extraordinary songs. Um, the thing I always found out about the Bee Gees is sometimes they just didn't seem happy in their own skin. They kind of wanted to be something else. And uh, but they are just not acting in any of this. Um, they, they, they wanted to be the Beatles. They did. And they just weren't, you know. Um, then one of my favorite things happens in the movie next, which is you get to see uh, Tower Records on Sunset Strip, which is one of the greatest buildings of all time. And that was nice. Uh, and then a billboard comes to light. 
Yes. And a billboard where the Bee Gees and Lucy and the Diamonds sort of have a sexy dance and Strawberry Fields witnesses this in a dream and is quite distraught, it has to be said. Yes. Um, and then again, somewhere in the middle of all this, mean Mr. Mustard gets his robot massage. Yes, uh, he, he is stealing. He's still back in Heartland uh, stealing yes. instruments. He is stealing the instruments that have illegally been bequeathed to the city. Please yes. keep up everybody. And he disperses these instruments to various people. Uh, to evil mind. henchmen. Evil, evil henchmen. Yes. So the two evil henchmen, I think these are interesting scenes. I'm not saying they're great. But I should are, think you're not saying that great. They are quite curiously interesting. So the two evil henchmen are uh, a Dr. Maxwell, who is played by Steve Martin, and he sings Maxwell's Silver Hammer. Mm. And at 1978, there is no bigger comedian in the USA than Steve Martin. He is playing, he's probably the first comedian to play arenas. And, uh, you know, he has hosted, he's like, he's a Saturday Night Live is only about three years old, but he's broken the hosting record. He hosts three times in one season. You know, he's, he's almost like a member of the cast there. He's on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show and he hasn't made a movie yet. This is his movie debut. And when I was watching it again this week, I kind of realized that when you watch Steve Martin, it is completely over the top and hugely broad and totally pitched wrong because he's kind of pitching himself as if he is playing to an arena of 20,000 people. Yeah. It's very broad, w- wobbly, over the top. He's doing his wild and crazy guy persona video where he's got the crazy voice that he used to do. And, uh, you know, it's it's very curious to see him considering what we know in the next 10 years that he goes on to write and perform and become quite uh, methodical about the art of comedy, that he's doing this big, broad thing. So it's it's worth seeing as a curio, not because it's good, the next sequence with Alec, Alice Cooper in it, I did like. He's Alice Cooper's great. Alice Cooper's fantastic, like some sort of malevolent Frank Zappa singing, uh, the singing, um, what's, I forgot what he's singing. Alice Cooper is already a big over the top cartoon character. Yeah, so he fits in absolutely fine. Uh, yeah, and I have to say, I completely unironically love Alice Cooper. I saw Alice Cooper about two years ago in the Olympia, and it was just. Fantastic. And he has a great new album came out in 2020. Um, okay. With, Which with has his, the original band, is not it? With the original band. And it's just hilariously funny, incredibly politically incorrect, but very funny and very enjoyable. So um, what happens is they, they decide to do a, uh, you know, the, the Heartland falls into disrepair. Lots instantly, of instantly. No, like, oh, they, you know, just... just that's it. It's you know. just wiped out because these instruments have been taken. So they decide to do a, you know, benefit concert, you know, sort of their own kind of cappuccino gig. And uh, but mean Mr. Mustard kidnaps Strawberry Fields. Um, and there's only one logical way to, to track her down, isn't there? There is. Uh, they the band set off in hot pursuit via the town's hot air balloon. I yeah, every town's got a hot air balloon. And um they go off and they uh, Earth, Wind and Fire appear for some reason and they do a great version of Gotta Get You Into My Life, the only song on the soundtrack not produced by George Martin. And it's uh, great. And it's great. <laughs> um, but they do come face to face with the future villain band who are another one of your live favourites. I Yes, it's all, it's all coming out now. It's Alice Cooper and it's Aerosmith. So we, but the, the, the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and Strawberry are captured and forced to watch a performance by Aerosmith. And I think it's not so bad. That's, that's OK. That's like, you know, bring out the comfy chair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Poker with the cushions. Yeah. But, um, but, but sadly, there's a fight and Steven Tyler dies. And in the struggle, Strawberry Fields dies as well. And... That's where the movie takes a bit of a turn because it gets quite Strawberry dark at Fields this point. Yeah, is is Billy Shears's beloved, and um, you know, Peter Frampton becomes quite despondent from her death. He's probably also seen the chart returns for "I'm in You," <laughs> and he's uh, he doesn't know what to do. So they all start singing, um, you know, "A Day in the Life," and uh, there's a uh, she's put into a glass coffin and paraded around. Uh, the town of Heartland while they sing to her. It's traditional. Okay, if you say so. And uh, so but once she is buried, um, Billy Shears decides to throw himself off a building, which he does. However, he doesn't reach the ground because of who? The Heartland weather vane, yes. play, played by Billy Preston, 
comes to life <laughs> and lifts him back to the rooftop. And not only is Billy Shears saved, but he is cured of his depression by this surprising turn of events. Yes, and he also resurrects Strawberry Fields in something, and she doesn't even look like a zombie or anything. She looks no, absolutely great. She looks absolutely and, great. And, and, and then he changes Mean Mr. Mustard into a bishop. Yes, and, uh, and, and his mean wagon into a little beetle, which might be an in-joke, I'm not really sure. And, uh, and then what happens is a ton of people descend on Heartland to sing Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band as an outgoing finale. And it is the strangest group of people I have ever seen in my life. And, and I'm hoping you have a list. Oh, you know I have a list. But you know who's there right in the thick of it? Because I was watching it and I hadn't seen it in over 25 years. And I'm watching and I'm, I said to myself, oh, my God, there's Donovan. Eh? Donovan's there. He's responsible for all of this. He, he's, he's everywhere. <laughs> it was all his idea. Um, in this massive crowd, alongside Donovan and lesser people, obviously, you have, uh, in no particular order, I'm going to read these out randomly, uh, George Benson, uh, Jack Bruce, Stephen Bishop, Keith Carradine, Carol Channing, Curtis Mayfield, Peter Noon, uh, Robert Palmer, uh, Wilson Pickett, Helen Reddy, Bonnie Raitt, uh, Rick Derringer, Barbara Dixon, uh, Randy Edelman, uh, Jose Felicicano, <laughs> Shanana, worst band of all time. Um, Minnie Ripperton, bless her. Um, Nona Hendrix, Hart, Adrian Gervitz, and he hadn't even written his classic yet. Al Stewart, Connie Stevens, Del Shannon, um, John Stewart, Tina Turner, looking like amazing. Tina Turner, yeah. Looking like Tina Turner. Uh, Etta James, whose uh, band leader would uh, go on to be in Paul McCartney's band. Dr. John, who'd go on to be in the all-star band. Bruce Johnson from um, uh, Beach Boys. Marcy Levy, who'd go on to be in Shakespeare's sister. Uh, Nils Lofgren, who'd go on to be in the E Street Band. Uh, Alan White, Bobby Womack, Wolfman Jack. Uh, Hank Williams Jr. Uh, and John Mayo and Jackie Lomax. And more. But all of these people just appear in the last five minutes of the film. And it is, from what's already been a strange hour and 45 minutes, it just makes it even more strange. Were all these people living in Heartland? Uh, is that what we're supposed to believe? It's, it's, it, it, it must have just been any musician within a 50 mile radius. So just, it, Heartland is actually just a giant retirement home for... Uh... <laughs> well, these people were all still young. It's 1978 when this is going out. So they're all... Oh, they were all very old at that point. <laughs> it, Listen, I was, I was watching it. I was watching it. I was 15. These were old people. Well, that, yeah, that is, that is true, you know. Um, now, when you make a movie, uh, it is traditional to put the movie out and then people have opinions about the movie. I believe and so. The opinions on this movie were out of the gate poor. And once again, to contextualize, uh, you know, uh, the Robert Sigurd organization had turned a an article written by Nick Cohn about disco dancing into Saturday Night Fever, which had become the world's biggest selling soundtrack mm -hmm. album. Uh, you know, uh, when the songs appeared towards the end of 76 and all throughout 77, Bee Gees dominated Greece with its new, um, you know, um, Morris Gibb theme tune, uh, you know, and the associated songs. That was a massive seller. So it seemed, it's not an unreasonable leap of faith to say in the weeks before this movie came out, the biggest band at the minute versus the, plus the biggest band of all time with the company who are on a hot streak, what could possibly go wrong? But the reality is that the reviews are just savage and they're they're right well you yes. have spoken you have spoken the <laughs> critics have spoken um yeah it, the thing is it's it's you know normally you get a bad review or you get a couple of bad reviews and there's somebody saying oh, it's not that bad or it's quite good or it has some redeeming qualities but they are just universally i mean they're terrible they're just awful yeah. reviews it's almost it's almost a conspiracy i think well, you know, Rolling Stone said this album proves conclusively that you can't go home again in 1978. Or if you do, you better be aware who's taken uh, who's taken over the neighborhood. Uh, Newsweek described it as a film with a dangerous resemblance to wallpaper, <laughs> 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 which is quite funny. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, my, my favorite. My favorite. Yes. My favorite is, J is Janet Maslin in the New York Times. What does she uh, say? The musical numbers are strung together so mindlessly that the movie has the feel of an interminable 
variety show conceived in the spirit of merriment watching it feels like playing shuffleboard at the absolutely insistence of a bossy shipboard social directory director when whimsy gets to be this overbearing it simply isn't whimsy anymore yeah um yeah so not good it remains at 12 percent on 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 rotten tomatoes in, in these this day and age uh, we have quotes from George and Ringo about the film. And uh, I find George, when he was asked about the film in 1979, I think he, he's he's 100% right in what he says. He's quite charitable. I mean, given given, given his, his kind of traditionally cantankerous demeanour, I think he's quite, you know, he can see, he can see he has sympathy. Yeah, he says that, you know, he has sympathy for Stigwood Frampton and the Bee Gees and acknowledged they'd all worked hard to achieve success before making the film. He said of Frampton and the Bee Gees, I think it damaged their images, their careers, and they didn't need to do that. It's just like the Beatles trying to do the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones can do it better. He's totally perceptive. They, yeah. and, and you kind of wonder, the Bee Gees are great songwriters. Why would they sign up to do other people's songs? You know, why not just create a Bee Gees movie musical from scratch? Because it's, it's like Robin said, they can do it better than the Beatles. Well, yes, this is true. He's, um, And then Peter Frampton eventually ends up in Ringo's band, doesn't he? This is this is very funny. This is from from Frampton's book, and he he records it during one of the All Star tours. He says, "I got interviewed, and Ringo was in the dressing room." And the journalist said, "So, Peter, how do you feel about your version of Sergeant Pepper in the movie?" I didn't say a word, and Ringo just said in a Liverpudlian accent, "Oh, we don't talk about that." And I thought, "Thank you, we don't talk about that. Everybody makes mistakes, you know." That's very kind and charitable. Um, the movie apparently had a production budget of 13 million and was a minor uh, success grossing just over 20 million. So maybe not totally in the red, but the the movie soundtrack album also had a ton of money attached to it. And it's hard to think when you've sold the biggest selling movie soundtrack of all time in Saturday Night Fever, you know, what kind of album could wipe out that success? Yes. And it was... That's what this album did. All the money they made in 77 was wiped out. Yes. And I mean, this is famously, this is described as the first record to return platinum. Four yeah. million copies were taken off the shelves and shipped back to the distributors. Um, and it said hundreds of thousands of copies were actually ended up being destroyed by RSO. Yes. And it, it, um, it, it isn't an album that you see. I mean, I've rarely seen the album in a secondhand shop or a charity base. And maybe at the time it, it, there were dozens of them, but I, 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 you certainly don't see them now. So perhaps they were all sent back and pulped. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the figures in the notes here, like RSO uh, invested 12 million into the soundtrack uh, 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 which seems like an insane amount of money. Yeah. And, but I guess they mean that part of that's going into the production of the film as well. And I suppose they, they, I suppose they also would have had to get, you know, pay the other, the artist labels to release them to do something for RSO, I suppose. Yes. And uh, the, the, um, the, there was one million put aside for promotion. So huge, huge money. And, you know, the, it's a soundtrack that's, you know, they're both kind of wary where you're kind of asking the Bee Gees and Frampton to work together with, and, you know, the Bee Gees are coming off a hot streak, but part of that's to do with, you know, they've had control over the record production. Now George Martin is here and he's this musical director, conductor, arranger. He is very much involved in it. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just to cure its egg. None of it comes out working well at all. No, and it's a, it's it's a kind of for, for for George Martin to be the producer. It's a mishmash of styles, you know. It's yeah. it's uh, and it's just very difficult to pull to pull up pull off. And uh, you know, like the film, they they it got terrible reviews. Um, Robert Criscoy gave it a D plus with uh, adding <laughs> must avoid. Um, and he said, apart from. Earth, Wind and Fire, most of the arrangements are lifted whole without the benefit of vocal presence. And I said, maybe Morris should try hormones. You, know, you wouldn't get away with that now. I, I do. I am surprised at, you know, there are BG songs out there with wonderful uh, vocal performances on them. But the Bee Gees vocal performances across almost all of these tracks is very anemic, very nondescript. It's very hard to get any directness or, or power from them. But it's 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 because they're not being the Bee Gees. I mean, they're yes. they're, they're 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 
I mean, it's almost as if they're acting in the recording studio. They're they're not. It's not the BG sound that's being produced here. Yeah. Um, uh, who is it? Uh, another um, another reviewer, Stephen Eldwin from All Music, said there's no erasing the fact that this is just an absolutely uh, atrocious record. Uh, there were some minor hits from the album, though, weren't there? Yes. Uh, so you, you mentioned Earth, Wind and Fire, uh, Got to Get You Into My Life, which is a million selling single. And it's, you know, that's a great version. That That's where they take the song, they do something different with it. Um, and I, I have to say, I'm not a big fan of um, cover versions of Beatles songs generally, but yeah. that is that is a great cover. Um, Robin Gibbs uh, version of Oh Darling charts in the top 40 in the US and Aerosmith's version of Come Together. And again, I quite like Aerosmith's version of Come Together. I appreciate that's heresy, but... No, it, it, it is nice. And uh, you know, Aerosmith were quite tickled at the time to work with George Martin. I mean, uh, the Aerosmith have kind of said that, you know, um, yes, this whole film's a train wreck, but we kind of got away with it because we got to play basically bad guy versions of ourselves and we did it because we wanted to be ferried around and meet George Martin. Yes, I mean, they tell a great story about recording that and uh, he said Aerosmith had a bit of a reputation at that stage for being quite difficult in the studio and taking a long time and and uh, um, they, they recount the fact that George Martin said to them, uh, Jeff Beck is playing in town uh, at such and such a club tonight and if we can get this done, we can go and see Jeff Beck because um, I think it's Blow by Blow was the album that had just come out by Jeff Beck and had been produced by George Martin. So, of course, Steven Tyler in particular, uh, Joe Perry, they want to see Jeff Beck. They go into the studio. They nail this song in two takes. And mm-hmm. then Perry recounts, you know, they come out of the studio, into the control room. George Martin's nowhere to be found. He's disappeared with the tapes. And, of course, Jeff Beck isn't playing anywhere near them. <laughs> and uh, he, just that George Martin was not prepared to spend any more time than strictly necessary in the studio with Aerosmith. I like how George Martin, you know, they, they're running through the song for George Martin and they expect him to get all, you know, roll up his sleeves and get involved. And he's like, that sounds good, chaps. Just keep on going on. Yeah, just keep keep going. I'll speed up some piano later on. It's going to be fine. Um, he's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it is nice to see Tyler and Perry being young men singing on the film, actually, I have to admit. Um, but, you know, don't forget, this is a, this is an album that has George Bernstein fixing a hole. Uh, Alice Cooper singing Because that's the song Alice Cooper does um, plus Steve Martin's Maxwell Silver Hammer Billy Preston's Get Back has a bit of spirit to it but it's not I have bad. to admit yep. his, 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 you know I just feel bad from um, but you he, know all he's, music are, yeah he's, you know, he's playing the part of a weather vane yes <laughs> not, not much you can do with that not much you can do with that I think. Um, but it's been described as it's, it's so bad it's not even camp which I agree with there isn't yeah. anything to enjoy no. out of its out of its inherent um badness and you know the album comes out a few weeks before the um the movie so the album does uh, kind of get into the top 10 in the u.s billboard charts but as soon as the movie comes out and and the associated train wreck the album just disappears and as you say there's four million copies returned to uh distributors which is just an extraordinary an extraordinary number um so you know the movie might have seemed a good idea at the time but you know when any, everybody looks back at any of this it's all just a uh, uh, a big mess, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you 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 have got to kind of feel sorry for the Bee Gees and Frampton because you do have a clear sense that they were bounced into this, that Stig would, uh, you know, that if they'd had time to sit back and think about it, you know, th- th- this was never going to work, you know? Yes. Um, yeah. And I suppose it's easy for, for us to say with hindsight, but it was just a complete mess. Um, in a way... Is it, I mean, not that I've seen all of Mamma Mia, but is it is it comparable to that? You have children. I'm sure you've seen Mamma Mia. Uh, my kids have seen it. I haven't seen it, but they kind of like Good it. Good for you. You know, <laughs> I've managed to avoid, I'm, I'm not, I'm not against seeing Mamma Mia. I just never. Um, I wonder, um, I wonder if we sourced this on, uh, you, well, it's on YouTube, this film, Sergeant Pepper. So yes. if we, if we sat. Well, your ch- I dug it out in the last week. So you yeah. can. So if we sat your children down and made them watch it, do you think they'd enjoy it? No. And the, the thing that's the thing that I realize uh, from you know with my own kids is that um, their critical faculties 
are pretty sharp. Uh, you know, you, you know, you hear parents tiring of things like Marvel films and all the rest, yeah. but the reality is they can spot a they can spot a bad thing when they see it. You know, we we watched that Wonder Woman 1984 movie recently, and that stinks. And the kids, well, two of my three kids were saying that stinks, and I'm like, yeah, it does. This is a really bad action film. So you know, kids have a critical faculty for zoning in on certain things that uh, that are good and certain things that are bad. I find, you know, I think the flip is true where people think it's easy to make, you know, like, you know, you see people like Madonna writing children's books thinking, oh, it must be easy. It ain't easy to write a, a good children's book, I'll tell you. Um, it, well, there's there's a couple of contemporary articles you you pushed to me uh, uh, about this. And there's one or two interesting things I saw, which was Stigwood saying that it took a year to negotiate the rights to get the songs because anything to do, this is Stigwood talking here, anything to do with the Beatles is very complicated. But I must say they were very cooperative um, and that the Beatles were also given the right to approve the screenplay, the director and a representative of ATV Music was empowered to attend each day's screening to alert John and Paul if their work was being massacred. Now that person is probably the very definition of asleep at the wheel, I would say. <laughs> Whoever was on set... I, f I find that very hard to believe because I, I think, well, he would have been negotiating with ATV and Northern songs. Uh, it would be Lou Grade who would be approving the use of the yeah. songs. But he does also say, the, 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 the interviewer says, is this because, were they cooperative because they knew you? And it said, sure, said Stigwood and added with a short laugh and they have a good piece of the picture. But he he must be talking about the songwriting royalties going through Northern songs, you know, that must be. I think, I think, I think, yeah, I think Stigwood was BSing a little bit. I think I would be surprised if the Beatles had any say or control or I, I guess they were potentially also at a point in their lives where they just weren't interested in rolling up their sleeves and micromanaging a thing like this. Yeah. I mean, it, th th this, you know, if we kind of flip forward a year or two, you know, shortly before his death, Lennon is putting together an affidavit saying, oh, we're all going to get back together again and we're going to tour and we're going to do this. And that's in the context of trying to stop one of these stage shows. Yeah. Um, I think it's the Beatlemania show. Um, so that's the point, you know, th at this point in the late seventies, they haven't really, I suppose, got their act together in terms of dealing with, uh, uh, th this kind of third party thing. The other aspect of this is we know they don't like Stigwood. Yeah. You know, yeah, McCart no, McCartney, know. And McCartney in 2000 is still referring back to this idea that, you know, how, how they said, and I, there's a piece, um, I turned up in Mark Lewison's book, um, which recounts the fact that when they first came down to London, they were sort of doing the rounds of music papers and, and things like that. And they went to one of the offices of a music paper that was being run by Stigwood and the, the, they were treated appallingly badly. This very kind of uh, superior patronizing uh, journalist was dealing with them and they absolutely hated them. And at one point, Lennon just called a halt to the whole thing and they got up and left. And on the way out, they kind of, Lennon swept a, a sort of plaster bust thing off this journalist's desk and, and, and smashed it. And they seem to, you know, the Beatles hold the grudge, you know, you, you, um, and I think they just don't like Stigwood. Um, never did. And um, maybe it goes all the way back to there. So it's hard to see that they were, I, I think that whole thing about the Beatles cooperating is probably just a bit of uh, flannel from. Yeah, I think, I think it, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a bit of a puff piece. I don't think it's true at all. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that spins off in this film was that it, it, it sort of wiped out the Bee Gees, but the Bee Gees still had a very successful 1979 you know they, yeah. they had their spirits having flown was kind of their proper formal follow-up album uh you know the single tragedy came out they were working on their own music on the set of the sergeant pepper film weren't they yes yes uh so you know the, the, this is kind of i suppose their peak songwriting period yeah. you know where they're just kind of churning out the hits yeah and uh, you, there was one day they wrote three number ones in an afternoon Yes. So this is just they 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 record uh, uh, they they take a, an afternoon off and they say right you know we're just going to sit and write some songs and uh, you're going to put me on the spot by asking me what the songs are and I can't remember. I don't know. The songs were Shadow Dancing, which Andy Gibb took to number one, and it would have been interesting to see why whether Andy Gibb was ever in the running for the Peter Frampton role in this film. Um, tragedy and Too Much Heaven. 
So Tragedy and Too Much Heaven were their big comeback number one singles in 1979. And Spirits Having Flown in 79, the Bee Gees also went off on a massive tour. They they, they didn't really, they weren't able to tour in parts of 77 and 78 because they were involved in this film. So the 79, the Bee Gees have a massive tour. They have a massive album. Um, but it's almost as if when the candle goes out on the decade itself, you know, their, their, their subsequent album is uh, is just not a big hit. And they, they kind of stop selling records under the Bee Gees name to any great number uh, in, in the States. But they obviously, you know, the Bee Gees go on and on and on. They just change direction. Was that the Sgt. Pepper film or was that Disco Sucks? Well, have you seen the the Frank Marshall Bee Gees yes, documentary? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they kind of, uh, as, as a documentary goes, it falls right into that trap of, you know, I'm looking at my watch, realizing there's 10 minutes left, and I'm like, oh, we're not going to get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, they're going to squeeze the 80s and 90s into the last 10 minutes. Um, you know, they talked about the whole disco sucks movement as, you know, having, you know, a homophobic or a racist element to it as well. Very snide, very short-sighted. Um, they were so big in those last few years uh, of the 70s that, of course, they had to come down. But I, I, I think... I, I think it comes back to that thing that I, I think was the, the Bee Gees Achilles heel where they, they they were a bit uncertain about their style or their attitude or themselves. Even watching that, that Frank Marshall documentary, it, it, they're prodigiously talented singers and writers. I just don't think they're that interesting. They were tremendously uncool. Yeah. At every stage of their career. Mm. You know what and. Yeah, but I also think they had a they had an odd chip on their shoulder throughout their career about it, a, a, a bit like our friend Phil Collins, you know. Phil isn't tremendously on call, is he? No, well, he sort of Phil sort of has this thing of you I know, know what you mean. You, you know, yeah, where he's like, well, why am I? Why am I something else? I, yeah, I sometimes like, get that vibe. It's like Van Morrison not understanding why he can't understand. Bob Geldof said, <laughs> Bob Geldof once said, the secret to understanding Van Morrison is to realize he spends most of his time wondering why he isn't Mick Jagger. <laughs> right. That must take a lot of time. Um, so, but, but obviously the Bee Gees segue into doing fantastic production work for Barbara Streisand, Dionne Warwick, uh, uh, Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers, uh, Chain Reaction for Diana Ross. They... You know, the, they certainly reestablished themselves in Europe by the late 80s. Uh, you Win Again is a fantastic song, although don't re read the lyrics, they're a bit strange. And even up until the very end, uh, I think You Win Again only went to about number 80 in America, um, but it was number one all across Europe in 1987. Uh, and even towards the very end, I think their last album, uh, This Is Where I Came In, the, the title track of that album is, you know, one of their best songs. It's a fantastic track. Um, so, you know, the Bee Gees... I guess they were so big they had to come down. But it, it did happen extraordinarily quickly when that 1981 Lion Eyes album came out that it just, you know, sold about 5% of what its predecessors sold. For someone that doesn't know much about the Bee Gees, you know an awful lot about the Bee Gees. I, mean, I just, I just, I, 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 you know, yeah, a lifetime spent in the Guinness Book of Rockstars and you just sort of remember all this stuff. Um, but the, the, the final question I'd ask about this is, did this movie damage Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the album, the Beatles album. Did it damage the Beatles at all? I really don't think so. Yeah. I, I remember as, as a kind of 15-year-old going to see this movie, absolutely hitting this movie, but not in any way thinking this, this is affecting my enjoyment of the original album or the Beatles, or I just kind of thought, well, it's something completely different. It's, it's, it's not to do with them. It's just other people doing their songs. And I mean, I think my, I remember being appalled at the Frankie Hard turn mm -hmm. in the movie and the, the Steve Martin sequence are kind of seared into my brain. I remember liking the Aerosmith. I don't remember Alice Cooper at all from seeing it the first time. Um, but I just thought, yeah, I thought this is this just has nothing to do with the Beatles. And I don't I don't really think the Beatles. The, the thing is, the Beatles at that point in the late 70s, particularly in the UK, were nowhere. You know, n no one was interested. I th yeah. And I think it, it is it is shocking how unbeatly the film is, considering it's all Beatles songs. Um, you know, and most of the songs are all from Sgt. Pepper, Abbey Road. There's nothing before Revolver. There's only got to get you into my life from Revolver. 
and there's there's the you know, the long winding road makes an appearance, but it's really all you know Sergeant Pepper and uh, Abbey Road, nothing from the White Album. Uh, and uh, within you, without you, doesn't make an appearance. It's that no. you think you know. <laughs> well, seriously, there is one song that does not appear that you would think if you were going for a completely oh, yeah. literal take. Who's this coming down the street handing out the parking tickets? Yeah. It's lovely, Rita. You would sing a song about her. You would think, you know, there would be a parking meter attendant. Who who, who was big in 1978 who could have done a comic turn? Oh, lovely, Rita. And Margaret. (laughs) (laughs) That's your solution to everything. You know what? There is no, there is no film or indeed any situation in life that cannot be improved by the introduction of Anne Margaret. Uh, a total, total sideline. If anyone wants to go off and watch um, Kristen Wiig as Anne Margaret turning off a light, go look for it on YouTube. It's very funny. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, 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 yeah, it doesn't put you off the Beatles album. When I see the movie, I think, uh, oh, these people have just totally gotten the wrong end of the stick about the Beatles and this album and everything else. And it's all just a clanging disaster. Uh, that's the end of it. I, I think we've exhausted this topic, have we, Stephen? I think so. I have one quote I'd like to to, to read out. Um, Le- what's the quote? To, to... The quote is from George Martin, who was asked at the time about this, and he said, I was scared of the responsibility. Whichever way it turned out, it would offend someone, but I'm treating it like I might a Gershwin opera, as if a film were being made of Porgy and Bess. Its authenticity and integrity must be kept. But that doesn't mean doing exactly the same thing you did 10 years ago. But certain things are sacrosanct. Every week uh, on the podcast, we want to send you back. This week, we don't. No. We don't want to send you back to the album of the Sgt. Pepper soundtrack. We don't want to send you back to the movie. We just want you to know that hopefully, you know, we've been slightly more entertaining than that movie could ever aspire to be because it really is a very strange piece of work. But we know some of you will be drawn to its siren's call. So if you have seen it or listened to us, then why not let us know what you think in all the usual places uh, at Beatles Pod on Twitter, the Nothing's Real Facebook group run by Stephen. Uh, everything goes through our website, nothingisrealpod.com. We've got all our playlists. We've got links to our Instagram. Other podcasts that we've appeared on and interviews and things that we've done, uh, it's all on nothingisrealpod.com. Um, and our Instagram run by William. Uh, Join us all in all those places and keep the Beatles conversation going. Uh, But for now, my name is Jason Carty. My name's Stephen Cockcroft. And this has been Nothing Is Real.